Your Dodge dealer presents Showtime USA. Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Showtime USA. Now, you know, I don't think I have to introduce this little lady, do I? Because she's been with us so many times, she must be well known to you all. Miss Ava Gabor. <laughs> Well, Mr. Friedley, isn't television amazing? You just came through one door all alone, and now you came through the other door with a girl on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, she's here for a very particular reason. She's got a job to do. I know I have. Well, then I think I better uh, put you right on now that I've brought you down and let you introduce the first guest. All right, I will. You know, we've got a great show, Ava, and you'll have good luck, won't you? And a good I time. hope. Have I fun. hope. I have fun. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have many more left. I mean the comedians of the gay 90s who made us laugh at the lyrics and tap our feet to the tunes of the old-time songs. Of those who are doing that gay sort of a work today, by far the most successful is a young lady who wasn't even born when the 90s passed into the 20th century. She's known and loved by millions, and it's my pleasure to introduce her to you now. Ladies and gentlemen, start laughing, start singing with Beatrice Kay. Thank you, I am so happy you are here. Thank you, Ava. I'm happy, too. You know, I'm a record collector, and I have all of yours. You have all of my records? All of them. Tell me, which of the old ones do you like the best? Well, it's not from the gay 90s. It's oh. about a little Brooklyn girl. I love your Brooklyn accent. You like my Brooklyn accent? I do. <laughs> I like your accent, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, will you sing it for us? It's the phone call. I'd love to do it, Ava, very much. It's a very sad song. It's all about a little girl from Brooklyn. And brother, that's sad. <laughs> she was very disappointed in love. And every night in Prospect Park, in the dark, she'd sit all alone and she'd look up at the moon and she'd say, Jay, look at that moon. <laughs> that makes you think. What if the world was perfect? Imagine a perfect world. Joey'd never fail to show up for a date and they'd bring me presents. All kinds of commit commacks and small what nuts. <laughs> yeah. And the family'd have money. We could afford to get glasses for my sister. She could go talk to an optimist. And me, I wouldn't have to work no more for the telephone company. A girl gets pretty tired of being an operetta. A telephone operetta, I mean. <laughs> of course, if everything was perfect, there'd be no excitement. For instance, Mom wouldn't crown Pop with the flower pot every night. And she might as well do it. She's entitled to a little pleasure in life. <laughs> And Joey, well, what if he does forget to call me now and then? He just suffers from loss of memory. He's just got a case of magnesia. <laughs> you know, Joey, it's funny the way you keep me waiting for your phone call. But I love you, Joey. And I'll always keep my promise. I said that I would wait for you forever. Joey, I meant every word I said. The thought I'm not waiting forever. Mmm. The has that my head. I've been waiting for your phone call for 18 years. <laughs> Maybe you don't love me anymore. How long must I wait? 
for you to keep a date. Could it be, sweetheart, that you are sore? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I've been waiting for your phone call for 18 years. You told me that you'd call me back that day. I'm wasting my youth in a telephone booth. How could you treat your only love this way? I was young and healthy. <laughs> when you left me. <laughs> Has your love grown cold? You wreck things strange. Could it be a fickle? <laughs> uh. Ah, didn't you have the thing so? If you'd have written, I'd have sent a change in a postcard. I've been waiting for your phone call for 18 years. Could it be you found somebody new? <laughs> I'll wait for your phone call just 18 more. But after that, we are Roofs and Brooklyn Dodgers. But after that, we are the roof. Yeah, the roof. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, you know, some of the songs of the 90s have come back and they're just as popular as when they were first written. Take a song like Won't You Come Home, Bill Bailey. You know, that's on the hit parade today. We'd like to sing it for you. Only we'd like to sing it the way they sang it way back when. Oh, come on, Bill Bailey. Won't you come home? She moaned the whole night long. I'll do the washing, honey. Yeah, mate. I'll pay the rent. In order to drive our cars safely, we have to see where we're going. Now, here's a man who knows all about visibility in the cars we drive. He's Mr. Tom Gilbert, representing the engineering division, the men who design and build those great 1951 Dodge cars. Tom, uh, how has Dodge solved the problem of proper vision? Well, then, invisibility is vitally important for safe driving. And in the new 1951 Dodge, we have developed what we call watchtower visibility, giving you a broad, sweeping view in any direction from wherever you may be sitting in the car. Now, to do this, we have widened the huge landscape windshield and narrowed the posts at the side to eliminate any possible blind spots. And we made the big rear picture window even wider than last year's. Nine inches wider, to be exact. It's one of the biggest windows ever put into any automobile. And Dodge has big side windows placed for best vision. And to take advantage of all this extra glass, 
Dodge gives you knee-level seats so that you can sit comfortably and still look out, see where you're going, and see where you've been. And tying in with all this increased visibility is this new sloping hood line that gives you an even better than ever view of the road right up close to the car. Now I'd like to show you just what this means to you. Here is an exact scale reproduction of the view of a road as seen from the driver's seat of a car costing just about a thousand dollars more than Dodge. And now here is the same view when you're sitting in the driver's seat of a new 1951 Dodge enjoying watchtower visibility in every direction. There's an amazing difference, isn't there? Watchtower visibility is just one example of designing cars around people using simple, basic engineering principles that are too often overlooked by many car manufacturers. Of course, this is just one of the many extra value features your Dodge dealer will be glad to show you. So stop in and see him, and he'll prove to you that you could pay a thousand dollars more for a car and still not get all the comfort and rugged dependability of this great new 1951 Dodge. And now back to Ava Gabor. <laughs> The purest kind of comedy is pantomime. Pantomime is a way of saying something without words, with gestures or expressions. For instance, if I want to show surprise, I do this. Or if I want to register anger, I do this. Or if I want to pout, I do this. Or happiness, and so forth. To tell an entire story in pantomime is quite difficult. But to tell an entire story and make people laugh, that's an art. And our next guest on Showtime USA is just such an artist. He's a comedian who has made more comedies in Hollywood than anyone else. Now, for the first time on television, he's going to do one of his most famous pantomime routines. Ladies and gentlemen, a day in the park with Buster Keaton. <laughs>
New Dodge. Look at the new modern massive front that will set the style for years to come. And the new wider windshield gives greater visibility and safety. Here are long, low, road-hugging lines, real automobile beauty. But for all its smart lines, Dodge still gives you all the headroom you want in a car. Because Dodge is the car actually built around people. This rear window is one of the biggest ever put into an automobile. With the big eye-level side windows and big windshield, you get watchtower visibility in every direction from either seat. There's no car like the dependable, long-lasting Dodge for the long pull ahead. So for value, for dependability, for 51, see the new Dodge now on display at your Dodge dealers. Let him show you how you can pay $1,000 more and still not get a car so entirely new in style and engineering advancements as the new 1951 Dodge. <laughs> an event when a play written by George S. Kaufman opens on Broadway. Its latest one opened just two weeks ago. It was written in collaboration with Louine McGrath, who in private life is Mrs. George S. Kaufman. It is called The Small Hours, successfully produced by Max Gordon at the National Theatre on 41st Street, right here in New York. The Small Hours is an emotional and at the same time charming play about a woman, her husband, her children and her eventual triumph over her fear. The woman Laura Mitchell is portrayed by one of New York theater's favorite actresses. From the role of Molly Molloy in the front page to the part of Mrs. Clarence Day in Life is Father, all of us have applauded Miss Dorothy Stickney. Opposite Miss Stickney is one of our foremost leading men, 
regular patrons of Showtime USA will remember his fine performance here last fall with Miss Gertrude Lawrence. I'm talking about Mr. Paul McGrath. <laughs> now, now for a scene from the latest Broadway hit, The Small Hours. <laughs> The small hours, the small hours of the morning. This is the time when loneliness and fear, when anxiety and doubt creep into our minds and hearts. This is the time, and these are the hours all of us know so well, when sleep refuses to come and terror takes over. Laura Mitchell has been in bed for hours, twisting and turning, and finally sobbing into the darkness of her pillow. That party she and her husband attended earlier this evening. That is just one of the events which make her feel inadequate as the wife of the president of a distinguished publishing house, as the mother of two grown children. She hadn't wanted to go to that party. She'd known what it was going to be like. The brittle conversations which were snapped out over cocktails, the sophisticated exchanges across the dinner table, the worldly ladies and their gossip of the Riviera, the very clever stories at which Laura Mitchell laughed, always at the wrong place. Laura Mitchell feels very small and very much alone as she sobs into her pillow in the small hours, the small hours of the morning. Come on now, darling, come on. Don't take it so hard. I'm all right. Please leave me alone. Well, you were asleep when I came in, or I... I would have come over to you before. I wasn't really asleep. I was only ashamed to talk to you. But why should you be ashamed, my dear? What happened? I want you to divorce me. Divorce you? What are you talking about? I want you to divorce me. I don't belong with you anymore. Now, Laura, come on. Pull yourself together and tell me what you mean. All those people, I... I don't know what to say to them. You mean tonight? No, no, not just tonight. Whenever we go out, I... I don't know what to say to them. But, Laura, darling, just because you're shy with some of the people you have to meet with me nowadays... Harry, you married me when I was 18, and... Though you were 22, you were much younger than I was because you'd had less and, and you were unsure. So we grew up together for a while. Only you went on growing and I didn't. I just grew older. And because I wasn't a very clever person, I didn't understand this. I thought it was just your work that was pulling you away from me. But it wasn't. It was everything about you. It was your mind, your whole being. But how often do two people over the years develop in exactly the same way? You can't expect it, Laura. Now, look, because I'm involved with books and literary people, well, you've come to overvalue the importance of that kind of mind. But I can't even talk to you about other things anymore. The sort of... just little things. Well, that's because you've let yourself get in a panic. We still have plenty in common, you and I, Laura. The children, to begin with. We haven't shared the children for a long time. There's nothing I can do for Dorothy anymore. She's outgrown me, too. And Peter. I just don't seem to be able to reach him at all. But what about ourselves? What, what we've been through in all these years? The whole cumulative pattern of our life together. But there's getting less and less to hold the pattern together. <laughs> Oh, it isn't you, Harry, it's me. I lie there in the middle of the night thinking, and I just can't think straight anymore. I'm afraid of everything. Afraid the night will never finish, and afraid the next day will begin. Laura. Laura, do you think... Do you think it would help you any if you... If you talk to someone, try to get yourself adjusted. An analyst can't give me a better mind, and that's what I need if I'm to share your life. But they go deeper than that. They remove the fear, the fear that makes you feel inadequate. I couldn't do it. 
Maybe, maybe if I went away for a while. All right, if you like. Where would you go? Oh, I don't know. The Grecian Isles or my sister's in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, I guess. Maybe you could develop an outside interest. Take these women tonight, all of them doing something. But I'm not trained for anything. When I tried that job on Vogue, all those women, they were so quick, so alert. I couldn't keep up with them. Oh, but you ought to be with people more, Laura. What about your friends? It, it doesn't seem to me that you see enough people during the day. You only see my friends at night. Well... Well, let's see. What about some of those girls you used to see when we were first married? Uh, up on West 80th Street. Bessie Palmer and uh, that, that Benson girl and uh, uh, Viola something. Fraser. Viola Fraser. Why, it might be fun to see them again. Give a little lunch party. Oh, there are thousands of things for you to do. Now, look, wh why don't you lay out a little plan for yourself? So many hours a day, reading, going to art galleries, concerts. You'll begin to take a new interest in things. You think I could? Of course you could. Now, why don't you begin tomorrow? You're very sweet, Harry. Forgive me for being so silly. Oh, nonsense. Now, you'll be running a big salon before we know it. <laughs> salon. <laughs> Anyhow, let's, uh, let's sleep on it, huh? You, uh, you all right if I leave you now? Of course, Harry. And thank you, Harry, very much. Good night. Good night, Harry. Good night. Harry? Harry? Mm -hmm. I read a list somewhere of ten great books that everybody ought to read. I've read one of them, and I'm going to start on the other nine tomorrow. Our special thanks, ladies and gentlemen, to Eva Gabor, to Beatrice Kay, to Buster Keaton, to Dorothy Stickney, and to Paul McGrath. Next week on Showtime USA... Your Dodge dealer presents Benton Friedley, the King Cole Trio, Joey Brown, and Eddie Dowling and Joan McCracken in a scene from Angel and the Pawn Shop. This is Showtime USA. <laughs>